Right. So here we are, and before you think I'm completely mad, which I always say, everybody should make this as the general premise that all academics are seriously mad, uh, is this is James Cook, and he got a cabbage on his head. And I think we will uh, uh, hopefully, in the course of this lecture, discover why one of the most famous sons of the British Empire is depicted here uh, with a cabbage, because the cabbage has a particular function in estuaries. Not cabbages as such, but the similar process. So just to, well, come on. Just to recall, uh, we recap a little bit what we finished off last time. And we said basically estuaries are very productive systems for the reasons that we have different classes of primary producers and we will actually deal with some of them as we go through the first hour of today's lecture. And they're full of nutrients. Remember, I explained to you that your career is often as an aquatic scientist, you know, uh, starting off taking endless water samples and actually analyzing them. And nutrients are with us everywhere. They form part of the report card for Southeast Queensland. We talked about why nitrogen is important because it forms part of the chlorophyll atom. And without chlorophyll, there is no capture of photons for primary productivity. We also talked about why excess nitrogen often leads to very, very rapid and very massive phytoplankton blooms because it is that nitrogen which chlorophyll uh, needs. Uh, and if you basically uh, supply extra nitrogen, cells can actually divide and become more. Here we got a phytoplankton bloom coming out of an estuary. We also talked about the role of phosphorus because managing nutrients is often all about nitrogen and phosphorus. There's a big debate which one is more important, but never mind about that. And it's only because you need to have phosphorus to make any organic molecule uh, available as energy in our cell metabolisms. We also talked about limiting nitrogen and it opens it's often uh, iron or other stuff, but that's not really the case in estuaries where everything is in abundance and so productivity is often very, very high. We talked about phytoplankton, which are, of course, unicellular algae. Remember, uh, we met phytoplankton for the first time when we chatted about uh, the production of sediments in the open ocean. So if you have some skeletons of some uh, uh, phytoplankton in very high numbers and they settle to the seafloor, then uh, over millennia that can form very rich deposits. And now that we are allowed to drive uh, again, uh, you can actually uh, rest assured that much of the gasoline you use, I use the American word gasoline because it's diesel and uh, benzene, is essentially often the product of the organic molecules contained in phytoplankton. Of course, you know, that doesn't apply you know, if you're on a few classic land rovers because they hardly ever go. So, you know, you don't actually uh, use up uh, fossil fuels, which is an advantage. Uh, we also thought, you know, that phytoplankton often blooms in estuaries. And here, uh, here's my house. For those of you who haven't been uh, last time, so don't come here and, you know, expect free drinks. Well, if you actually turn up and you manage to find it, I'll give you a chin and tonic at five o'clock, you know, and we can sit and talk about estuaries um, and take the yacht out, an inspiring yacht, I should say. Uh, and you get this huge stupidity blooms coming out. Stupidity is a challenge for phytoplankton because it takes light to vape, but it also delivers nutrients from the catchments to the sea. And so essentially when you have uh, nutrients flowing from the catchment to an estuary, phytoplankton waits there, so to speak, and it just blooms, literally blooms. This is a study we did in the Marula estuary, and you can see the rainfall here, and after a big spike and a few other spikes, 
This is the salinity. It, of course, goes down because fresh water flushes into the estuary. But what it does is it really leads to a massive proliferation of phytoplankton cells. So in the old days, you know, we had a really, really, you know, uh, hope time trying to figure out who actually eats what. It's not actually that easy to determine because you kind of had to observe uh, what animals eat, either visually or you open their guts. But when you take those tiny little cells, they get absorbed very, very quickly and you are left with very, very much of a guessing game. Now, around, I would say, 1992, in seriousness, the game changed completely because we had the opportunity for the first time for still exorbitant high costs to measure the isotopic composition of the source material. Now, don't worry about the fancy numbers here. Has anybody actually heard about uh, stable isotope tracing, how it works? Any, any feedback from anybody? Or you can say no as well, so we make it a little bit more interactive. No. No? No. no. <laughs> All right. So uh, this is actually quite funny. Uh, I, uh, I once traveled on a plane uh, from Brisbane to Adelaide, where I had one of my collaborators, and I could use the stabilizer, the mass spectrometer, which is a very expensive machine, which goes bing, 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 you know, all the time. Never mind. And I had those samples and I carried them very carefully on a plane in an uh, uh, airtight uh, container. And then one of the security guards asked me, so um, what are you actually doing with those fine powders? It looks like cocaine once you actually grind the animals up and you desiccate them and blah, 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 blah. And I said, well, I work on, on isotopes. And he just happened to know isotopes has something to do with radioactivity. It doesn't really, but with nuclear uh, structures. And I got grounded because basically I sort of like, you know, and I had to go and have my radiation, uh, my body tested for radiation. However, what most people don't know is that carbon, nitrogen, sulfur, oxygen, all the common elements occur in one uh, more than one isotopic form. For instance, oh, here's a pencil. So uh, here's the camera. So that pencil here is, of course, graphite, which is carbon. Now, 99% of that carbon would have carbon atoms in it with 12 uh, uh, neutrons. However, a few neutrons. Uh, a few atoms have certain uh, uh, neutrons in it. And the same for nitrogen. Most of this is nitrogen 14 with 14 neutrons. Uh, and you actually have uh, only a few with 15. It's a very complicated process. But basically, every bit of organic material, which has nitrogen and carbon, has a unique isotopic signature. And those isotopes are stable. They don't actually disintegrate and cause radiation. This is what people basically think, you know, when you work on isotopes, you have to blow into tar. No, you don't. They are stable isotopes that just happen. I can explain the process at some other point. But essentially, what you can do, we manage to devise a process where we actually shoot the material into a strong magnet, and it spins around, and it just happens to be the case that the heavier isotopes, the ones with 13 uh, neutrons in the carbon and with 15 neutrons in the nitrogen, they have a little bit of a lag coming out the other side and you can measure the difference and get basically a signature. You get a chemical fingerprint of all the major elements. Now this is one of the first studies ever done in, uh, uh, in estuaries using this technique by some very dodgy characters as you can see here. Uh, picture this other fellow here. It's a fascinating name. His uh, parents were really, really, you know, dedicated fans of uh, Shakespeare. 
So his name is Wooldridge and he was English. And his first name wasn't quite Driss. It was Tristram Howe. How good is that? Of course, if you have to live your entire life with a name called Tristram Howe, it becomes a little bit, you know, uh, difficult. So what we did is we went to an estuary and to cut a long story short, uh, the question then was, uh, if you have benthic consumer, such as this amphi boat here, and this is a yabi, many of you would actually have seen yabi, you pump them out of the sediment and use them as bait for fishing, but they're basically crustaceans which live buried sometimes quite deep, up to a meter deep in estuarine mud. And if you want to figure out what those guys eat, it's hellishly difficult. But what we could actually do is, we figured out what the average concentration or the fingerprint of phytoplankton is. And it turned out to be quite luckily, a very different fingerprint from detritus coming in from plants, more or less reeds on the, growing on the side of the estuary. And what you can do then is, there's a fairly good known relationship between what you eat and what the fingerprint is of your main food. In other words, you are what you eat chemically. So if one of you, if you know, for those people of you who are vegans and you'd mostly let's say corn, you will have a very different body composition than people who eat beef, which is fed on grass because corn and grass have different carbon fingerprints. And that fingerprints and those fingerprints are reflected in the flesh of the consumer. So we could actually use this technique, which was at the time groundbreaking, to figure out, do those guys here rely most on phytoplankton or on detritus? There's a little bit of a chemical change uh, once it gets into the gut and then gets absorbed into the cells, but never mind about that. And you can actually project upwards. So what we actually found is literally all the ghost shrimp here, and this was very new because everybody else actually saw it, they actually come out at night and actually graze at the surface. But no, they actually sit inside and are very happy filtering phytoplankton up. And only a few crabs, and we didn't actually find that many, eat the detritus. So this is a technique you will actually encounter more and more and there's whole fields now on stable isotope ecology, which enables us to figure out what the real nutrition is of consumers in food webs. Quite fascinating. And, you know, this is a, a, a primitive example from 1996, but, you know, at the time it was basically totally cutting edge. And it still is when you can apply it in a good context, pretty much cutting edge techniques. Uh, any question on, on that kind of, you know, technique? I know it's a, a crash course in stabilizer of ecology, but I can talk about, uh, I can talk more about it if you actually want uh, in the next uh, few lectures. So if you want, you know, if you want me to explain a little bit more about how to actually use that, uh, I'm more than happy to do that. The application here is that phytoplankton obviously maintains in terms of energy supply, most of the yabbies here in the Pentus. Right, this is uh, some work we did some years ago when Palmerston Bessage was nominated to become a wetland of international importance and you have to write a very, very complicated, very long, very expensive application for that. And you have to, you know, this is actually sometimes assessed by people at the United Nations and some of them might not be the best ecologists. So you have to supply them with these pictures, which actually, actually is quite funny. So we supplied, uh, we, sorry, we contracted a, a, an artist to do that. And they tried, as you can see here, to mimic the level between high tide and low tide. And of course the birds couldn't actually drown. So they got actually very, very long legs. Those birds were not so lucky, they actually drowned at high tide, but never mind. And we got gigantic prawns and fish and crabs and so forth. But I want, what I wanted to actually uh, illustrate with that is that we said, oh, maybe something very, very important here is that 
there is wetlands on the side of the estuary. It's not only the stuff which floats inside, which is an important habitat and which is an important source of energy. So here we go. So we saw there's a lot of mangroves and please keep the mangroves intact because they contribute very, very, uh, in a very significant way to the habitat value and the energetics of promised passage. Now, if you ask two mangrove, uh, most ecologists working on estuaries, why are mangroves important? They usually say, ooh, because they create a habitat, particularly underwater, which has amazing habitat complexity. And that maze of little nooks and crannies is perfect for juvenile fish and prawns to hide uh, from predators. And hence, it becomes a high value nursery area. But if you go to a mangrove forest at low tide, oh, we actually got a plastic bottle sitting here. What you actually will find is there's quite a lot of dead leaves on the ground. As a matter of fact, you actually sh uh, if you want to find out how much uh, mangroves really shed their leaves, all you have to do is after a strong rain event, the next day you go to the beach, Marulaba, Maruchidua, anywhere near an estuary, and then you see or check out what's actually floating up at the drift line. And you will actually find, but well, we found dead possums and all sort of you know, uh, nasty stuff, but you actually find quite a lot of mangroves leaves. So they get washed out from the estuary. So the value of mangroves comes from two sources, really, or two principal processes. The one is the litter fall, the supply of detritus, and the other one is to supply or create a more complex habitat than would occur if it would just be plain mud. So mangroves are, of course, you know, not in a, in a reestry, but whether or not they can contribute quite heavily to the primary production. Now, this is a map of mangroves in southeast Queensland from Caloundra here all the way down to Palmerston the Passage. You see there's quite a few, and then you get into uh, the Depression Bay, oh, sorry, Deception Bay, uh, Oda Redcliffe, home of the original home. Uh, and then, you know, you go along Brisbane Airport, new runway, probably not so much. And really, the mangroves become very, very abundant is in the southern part here. And it's a little bit scattered, but there's many parts of the world where mangroves are important, much more abundant, I should say. People actually think mangroves have more or less a tropical to subtropical limit. This is actually quite true for most of the part, except in Australia, we have the really unique situation that they go all around the coast, well, they kind of skirt Tasmania. And even the New Zealanders have some, well, yeah, they have to have something, but never mind. You know, we give them a few mangroves. However, they get very, very stunted as you go further south. But in other parts of the world, this is a, a German naturalist, Alexander von Humboldt. And he was kind of a mad man. He was a very, very rich uh, nobleman. And then he decided, well, what I really want to do is I go to the Amazon basin. But then he said, oh, everybody goes to the Amazon. I want to study mangroves in the second largest river basin of South America, which is the Orinoco. And if you actually look at this one, it's like one of the world's most amazing mangrove or riparian forests. Other big mangrove areas in the world which dwarf anything we have is of course here in uh, Bangladesh and India in the Brahma Putra Ganges system. And here is something completely different. Now we're talking about uh, mangroves. What do you guys think is this stuff here? Why do I have a char of, what do you guys think that is? Maybe mangrove seeds crushed up or something like that? No. Sauerkraut? Correct, it is sauerkraut. Now, 
why do I give you uh, a picture of sauerkraut when we talk about mangrove seeds? Uh, bear with me for about 10 minutes and then it will all be revealed. Now, not so long ago, the biggest, biggest problem seafarers had when they set off on long voyages was that they all contracted a very, very awful disease called scurvy. You can play that video here about all the symptoms. It's rather unappetizing. And essentially what it does is your skin becomes very bloodshot, but the most uh, awful thing is all your teeth fall out because the gums recede and eventually your body shuts down and then you die. So the British Navy uh, lost on long voyages, on average, half to three quarters of all sailor due to scurvy. Now you might think, who knows what actually causes scurvy? Anybody? Yeah, it's uh, vitamin C, um, lack of vitamin C, isn't it? Correct. It's a lack of vitamin C because on the ships, they basically lived on pickled pork and dried biscuits, which basically was bread, which got dried and hard tech. And also, they each got a pint of rum a day. So you imagine that is worst, probably the worst diet ever. And nobody could really quite figure out of how to cure them. Hello, Ashley. <laughs> but uh, when some of the captains came back and reported to the Admiralty, they said, well, you know, we found that when the ship's crew ate more oranges or lemons, they usually were in better health. So they tried to actually produce a lemon concentrate, but they did something which, like a syrup, they boiled it. And when you actually boil it, it got destroyed. So that didn't really quite work. Um, here we go. And then uh, Captain James Cook, he got an order by the Admiralty to do something completely different. He said, well, what you should actually do is you take sauerkraut, pickled cabbage and fermented cabbage on your voyage and feed the man a portion of sauerkraut every day. Now, this was actually very very unpopular because uh, English seamen didn't actually eat German food and vice versa. And of course, it, it's a very, very acquired taste. Oh, I could actually show you some, but never mind. Uh, this is a thing of having props at home. And what actually happened was that James Cook, by using sauerkraut, which is a fermented leaves of the cabbage, was able to bring almost all of the crew home after two and a half years in the South Pacific. So something magically must actually happen if you ferment leaves of a plant. And you can probably make sauerkraut of just about every uh, substance you want. When we were children, we had to make sauerkraut, which was fantastic, because we actually, you know, we, we sliced the cabbages and then the most fun part was it all became into a big barrel and we got to jump on it for days on end because it actually had to compress. So it was basically uh, cheap entertainment. And of course, it gave extra flavor because you didn't really wash your feet. No, you actually did. And so what has this got to do with mangroves? Well, if you were to go into a mangrove forest and chew on leaves, nutritionally speaking, you would actually die. Why would you die? Two things, just like cabbage. Firstly, the leaves have a lot of what we call structural compounds. They basically need to keep their shape. And everything which keeps shape in a plant is basically woody. It's called a refractory macromolecule. The only, uh, uh, only cows and sheep and ruminants can digest it. That's why a cow is basically uh, 60% of volume is a, a digestive system. Same in a sheep, same in an antelope, whatever. Or termites can do it, but most animals can't actually break down those very, 
very uh, tough molecules. And the other thing is, essentially, there is very little energy in a leaf like this if it's fresh. And you know probably uh, that if you uh, choose to actually have all your nutrition from vegetable matters, volume by volume, you have to eat a lot more. Not maybe uh, weight by weight, but volume by volume you have because it is, you know, simply has less energy. But there is a way to actually introduce energy into uh, rotten plant matter. Look at the leaf down here. I mean, this is just after high tide, so it's actually all flushed out. And if you would actually have a close-up under the electron microscope of a leaf like this, it looks like that. Here is a plant fiber, and all those knobbly bits, those little golf balls, are bacteria. They might say, well, oh, the bacteria, and they're not very good. Well, it's excellent. So what you really want to do is have your leaf drop down and ferment, so to speak, rot a little bit and acquire the bacteria to become nutritious. It also breaks down the tough structural uh, molecules which give the leaves shape and then it becomes very much more nutritional. So this is what we associate in a, a litter for is uh, on planet Earth. And usually you put in litter for and you get one of those pictures of a deciduous forest, an oak forest somewhere in North America, or Canada or whatever, full of rustling leaves. But you can also go to a mango forest. I wish I would have taken this picture myself, but I actually absolutely love it. You can actually see the mangrove here. It looks like, you know, probably a progeria. And all those leaves floating here. That's excellent. Now, if you're a consumer in a mangrove forest, you actually want to feed on those things rather than on the fresh leaves. And why is that? Think about sauerkraut. You need to decompose it first to make it accessible, to enhance the nutrition, because it gets partly degraded by bacteria and fungi, and then essentially it goes off and becomes uh, what we call detritus, loaded with that extra microbial component, so to speak, and then essentially fish, prawns, fiddler grapes, whatever you have here, body heat, small risk, and other small crustaceans eat it. So here you go. Much of the nutrition of mangrove forest, that's the second uh, big function, comes from bacteria decomposing the detritus partly of it and making it more accessible. I, I put that in because people are always quite shocked. I mean, we went to Varanasi a few years ago and, you know, they burn uh, the corpses here uh, on the bank of the river uh, because it's a, a holy place. And all of that wood is actually mangroves. And you might think, oh, this is actually all terrible, but it's actually not. I mean, it's just cultural practice and it's actually done in a very, very dignified way. So mangroves have very sometimes unexpected, it's the only firewood they have there, uh, uh, ecosystem services. Now, the next habitat, we are going a little bit further up from the mangroves, a little bit further inland, comes to many people as a little bit of a surprise. Oh, no, sorry. It's actually going down here and about here. And that is something most people have no idea exists. Most ecologists don't. Now, if you look in the S train mud, quite often, uh, the tide is in, uh, so I can't actually show you, otherwise I would have gone out with the uh, camera, is sometimes it gets a bit of a green sheen. If you look at the green sheen more closely, or even more closely, it's actually a layer of algae, very small algae, and we call them benthic microalgae. I love this picture here, because think about it, it's just an illustration really here, that that thin film of benthic microalgae is nutritionally very, very important. Uh, you can call it microphytopentus or benthic microalgae, it doesn't really matter. Uh, look at the size of the bra. If that water column is about two or three meters deep, I mean, I, I want to actually catch some of them, but never mind. So uh, this is the formal uh, you know, rundown of how important microphytopentus is. 
So there is basically they're microscopic, they're single celled. Uh, many of them are cyanobacteria, like blue green bacteria. And usually they hang out in the top inch of the sediments and they can actually migrate up and down a little bit to catch the sunlight and then go down at night to avoid being washed out. You can see them on beaches and estuaries and they really give the surface of uh, the sediment, a sort of greenish, yellowish film. They're everywhere, uh, but they're kind of a bit hidden and they're really a very, very important food source. But what they really do is because it's almost putting like a semi permanent, almost like a second skin, yeah, like the stuff they actually use in surgery nowadays. But there's a fascinating new series out there that the history of surgery, it's on SBSS. Uh, some of the stuff is pretty out there, like the history of brain surgery. So I think we can count ourselves lucky. Uh, and so those biofilms essentially sit at the surface of the map and they bind the sediment together. Uh, they can be very, very important in terms of the primary production and they can equal that of phytoplankton. Now, the other thing which people usually like to preserve, a primary producer in estuaries or in shallow water, has to do with the sediment. That's a black swan. And uh, it is of significance because black swans, I mean, when the first uh, Europeans came, uh, Banks uh, was the naturalist on board the Endeavour with Cook. And they saw black swans, they actually saw it like the rum has, you know, done something very terrible to their brains, uh, or the wine has gone off. But black swans uh, feed on seagrass. There's something else about black swans in that they, is a, here's a black swan, and there's, you know, turtles, uh, dugon, and all the other fish in here. Uh, in that the word maruchi is a slightly uh, mangled uh, Aboriginal term for marumbin, which is the uh, word for seagrass, uh, now for black swan, uh, from, from the Morton Bay area. So the cool thing about seagrass is, you got a few examples up here, is that the, the only, the only, only marine flowering plant, they actually have flowers and they produce, you know, uh, basically reproductive organs in flowers underwater. If you actually hate keying things out and you want to know what everything is, you know, very quickly, uh, then don't work on insects, but work on seagrasses. There are very few species uh, globally, about 70, but most of them are very, very abundant. Uh, but here's the thing. Algae, no matter how big they are, and they can be pardon me, like, like kelp, they don't have roots. So they have to ab absorb all the nutrients through the outer body surface into the talus. Seagrasses have roots. As a matter of fact, they are the only marine plants, permanent flowering plants, permanently submerged with roots. And they have vascular tissue to store nutrients, sometimes in big rhizomes, which are parts of fruit sitting underneath the mud. And there's a huge competitive advantage over algae because they can take up nutrients not only from the water into their leaves, but mostly from the sediment, which is kind of cool. Now, the, why people like seagrass, uh, fisheries <laughs> ecologists like seagrass, because seagrass is an excellent fish habitat. But here is a conundrum. Uh, we did a, I, when I was a young marine biologist like you guys, I wanted to work on seagrass, God knows uh, why. And I just had this idea, it must be, everybody talks about it as such an important habitat, so surely lots of things must actually chomp on seagrass. Well, actually, not really, because the animals which were, uh, eat seagrass directly are, of course, very enigmatic ones. There are dugons, there are swans, and there are turtles. But as nice as those animals are, they're only 
represent a very small portion of total consumer biomass. Most fish don't eat seagrass, but the value of it is again, think about sauerkraut. When seagrass dies, or there's a strong uh, current sweeping through it you know, after a storm, you often see lots of it being washed up on the beach. It's the export of the dead material. And that's a common theme here. Now, you might actually think, well, seagrass is all lovely. But in many parts of the Mediterranean, after big winter storms, this is what the beach looks like. And they actually have to get machinery in to remove those meters and meters of rotting, stinking, piled up seagrass. And there's nice meadows out here where you can go snorkeling, but the winter storms uprooted and uh, deposited on the beach. So when we actually see a few seagrass being washed up on a beach, think about uh, it as a minor inconvenience because this is what really uh, can happen when meadows are composed of very large seagrass species and storms come in. Now, uh, the, in an ecological sense, that picture is there to illustrate to you that it is important to have material exported from one system to the next. So don't ever think about an ecosystem being in isolation. Unlike, you know, maybe you work on a small little freshwater fish pond or a lake, but even there, there's actually water running in and water running out and leaves are falling in from the, uh, from the forest. But most ecosystems are very much connected to each other via the flow of animals and the flow of detritus. There's of course a few really cool marine creatures out there uh, that actually eat seagrass directly, such as dugong. See this champ here. I mean, this is actually a classic example, you know, like uh, an animal only, or an offspring, a child, only a mother could love. But look at this few, uh, poor dugong here with all the uh, propeller scars on his head. It's actually quite sad. Now, does that work? Hello? I mean, if you think about it, uh, one should actually have a, a dugong as an example to people who don't yeah, believe in evolution. Because uh, if you let nature run for long enough, it's a classic example of how you can actually have a mammal going back into the sea after they have uh, conquered the land and become extremely specialized to feed on one particular source of you know small seagrass now um uh, a friend of mine did this work in in morton bay and not surprising really because there are major 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 grazers just like a buffalo uh, on on dry land or even more uh significant and if you look at seagrass, you know, which is not commonly grazed, it looks like this, then you actually get feeding scars going through it. And if there's lots of grazing, it looks like an overcut lawn. So in some instances, grazing have, can have a very, very direct impact on the seagrass. But in most instances, it's actually exported as that one. And Sostor here is a seagrass. And in some systems that you can see, they can have literally some of their most important contributions to primary productivity. Of... So uh, that was actually a rugby game, you know, when, when, when things were still better, you know, and Australia could actually still beat the old legs, but never mind. There was just a segue of going, uh, ah, here we go, an Australian try, over to New Zealand. Uh, you have to actually love the New Zealanders because I'm not going to go into any cheap uh, sheep jokes uh, because sheep jokes about New Zealanders are quite cheap, you know, never mind. Um, I'm tempted, but I'm not. Uh, and those sheep, you might think, ooh, they stand on a lawn. But they're actually not. It's a New Zealand uh, image. 
they stand on the bank of an estuary. You can actually see the mud here. So just at the top here, sometimes flooded by the very, very highest tide, you get this very funny looking lawn-like system. Now in some parts of the world, those are really very spectacular. Look at the estuarine channel here. But then there's this big, wide, flat floodplain. This grass. It's grass. Ah, here's another one. I mean, fantastic. Absolutely bloody fantastic. Look at all of those. And this is actually from the United States, from Georgia, the eastern seaboard where there is literally thousands of square kilometers of this really intricate uh, salt marsh estuaries. We even get them in England, you know, I don't know, that's supposed to be an you know, English sheep farmer with some, you know, scared looking sheep, you know, he's chasing them down the paddock here, but it's not really a paddock. He's actually chasing them down an estuarine lawny paddock -y thing. But it's not a normal grass, it's actually a salt marsh grass. It's salt tolerant grass. Uh, and, and usually, as you can see, it is very, very, yeah, not terribly uh, instructive conceptual diagram. The salt marsh grass sits behind the mangroves and up to the, uh, what we call usually the terrestrial trees. And you might say, oh, you know, I'm not in Georgia, I'm not in England, I'm not in France. We might be able to uh, travel to the United States again. So where am I going to find some salt marsh? Uh, the answer is, you're going to find some salt marsh. All you have to do is, for instance, go to our estuaries. They're not as extensive. But here's the news estuary. And everybody basically thinks like, oh, yeah, we got sandbanks, we got Hastings Street, not so much activity there to know. And there's lots of mangroves uh, lining the estuary here. But where's the salt marsh? Well, just opposite the uh, Newsaville here, there's an island called Gold Island. We spent quite a bit of time there doing various oyster reef restoration work. And when you actually look at it closer, yes, there's the bank here, and you got a houseboat. And all of that area here is actually a kind of brownish lawn which grows between the mangroves. So this is actually grass. It's salt marsh grass. Here is a close-up of that particular uh, uh, sector in the Nusa estuary on Goat Island. The uh, grass is called Sporobulus virginicus, but never mind about that. And it's a unique salt tolerant species which gets flooded every now and then. Those little channels, by the way, have two functions. They breed lots of mosquitoes. That's why people who live near uh, mangroves are usually not so happy about those. But that's kind of cool as well because the fish, the juvenile fish swim in here at high tide and eat the larvae of the mosquitoes. So if you want the formal breakdown here, it's really a helophyte. That basically means it's a combination of uh, physiological salt tolerance and usually a very stunted growth. Often they're quite monospecific as in Spatina and in uh, Sporobulus, and it's a very challenging habitat, but it has been much more ab uh, abundant in our estuaries before we started building on the banks. For instance, some of the early settler leases on the Marucci estuary were given out to people near Bly Bly to graze cattle on the salt marshes. And of course, those salt marshes have then been replaced by cane lands. And we're trying to get a few of them back by restoring them. So salt marshes were not necessarily a rare habitat in our part of the world. Now, bear with me because this is perhaps one of the most famous uh, food web diagrams ever in ecology. Uh, all of you are usually quite keen to learn about food webs. And the trick is really not so much to just draw arrows to actually find out who eats whom, but to understand how energy in a system is 
apportioned into different compartments of the food labs, where the big losses are and where the big exports are. It just turns out to be the case in 1962, this was the very, very first food lab, um, admittedly a very simple one, where people said, right, let's really measure every singular bit and find out where the energy goes. Rather than just saying, oh, well, you know, species A eats species B, and that kind of gets, you know, uh, scavenged when it dies by species C, which can then be eaten by species A, and so forth, and so forth. So let's do it actually properly and measure everything in the times that it in kilo calories per square meter per year, but never mind, lots of first pyramids loose, you got lots of leaf clippings, so you can actually measure how fast they grow, blah, 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 blah. So let's actually take this apart, and you can do all those calculations yourself, but yeah, I do it for you, and discover some really amazing surprises. Now, I'm continually surprised by people saying, what we should really do is plant more plants, plant more forests, because they're going to suck all the carbon out of the air. And that will actually be a good contribution to mitigate climate change. Well, let's think about this logically. Really, is it? Because, and it doesn't really matter whether it's a tree or not. Ooh. Oh, I shouldn't really lift it. Uh, I got what we have here, can you guys see it? Right, that's a plant. Ah, hang on. I need a... So that plant here, when the sun shines on it, it will photosynthesize hopefully make more uh, biomass, and it captures the carbon in the plant biomass. But as the sun goes down, it's not going to die overnight, and it's not going to stop down its metabolism. It respires. There are living organisms which respire. People just have this idea, and I don't know where this actually comes from, that plants basically photosynthesize, i.e. make oxygen all the time. As a matter of fact, about uh, more than three quarters of that particular spatina, but it doesn't really matter, comes in via CO2 and goes straight back out, as you can see here, as respiration. So only 25% of the CO2 is actually converted into organic biomass. And this is basically the argument people have, ooh, that, that, that's, that's what we really want. Uh, and that's sort of mitigating CO2 uh, production. But this is actually quite true. And everybody here, as I go through those arguments and something is not quite clear, stop me immediately, please. Because let's think about it. Even if, if it's in the form of, you know, the leaves here, I take it again, have those leaves here, will they live forever? No. And it doesn't really matter whether it's a redwood tree a seagrass, a mangrove, or this, you know, potted cyclami, essentially, plants die. They don't live forever. Some pot plants die quicker than others, uh, of course. But even in nature, it tree falls down, and what actually happens when it lies on the ground? It rots. It decomposes. Now, what is the one byproduct, the ultimate product, I should say, of bacterial decomposition. Anybody? Nitrogen? Nope. When nitrogen, they, they break down some of the proteins into nitrogen, which goes into the ground. But you know, let's talk about the carbon. We're talking about the carbon storage, which is often thought about it's going to solve the problems of the world. So if you actually plant a tree or have one of those, and then it dies after 20, 30, 80 years, what actually happens to these trees? It grumbles, it decomposes by fungi and by bacteria. But as they chump down that organic carbon, what do they produce? CO2, I'm guessing. CO2, correctly. 
And this is basically uh, how beer or sparkling wine gets the bubbles in it. If you actually drink, you know, champagne or beer, the bubbles are produced by yeast, which is a bacterium really, or a fungi, depending how you actually look at it, uh, basically uh, converting sugar into CO2. So here you go, ultimately, yes, there is carbon being removed from the atmosphere into plants, but the rest of the plants don't live forever. So when they die, well, it goes back out. So it works, but it's only a very short-term solution. The only solution where carbon really gets for a long period of time out of the atmosphere into a reservoir is by phytoplankton taking it up, sinking to the bottom of the ocean and becoming part of the sediments. The only way it gets released again is by man-made actions because we harvest those sediments, the oil reserves or the gas reserves, and we burn it again and release CO2. But normally, that's really the sink of carbon in the world, not trees. I'm sorry, it just is not biology. So, a lot of that energy which comes from the sun is immediately lost because the plants need to live as well and they respire. So, the energy which then is available, it's about 8,205 uh, kilocalories, 97% of it dies and goes into detritus. So, the grass dies and floats away into the yonder. So, in essence, it comes all back to the cabbage on Cook's head. That is then available for colonization by bacteria. As a matter of fact, only 3% of plant production is directly grazed. This is also why you can actually wander through an English oak forest in September, in the autumn, or in America, and become all romantic, eating chestnuts and drinking malt wine and all that kind of stuff, and essentially having all these rustling leaves because they never got eaten during the summer. They just fell down. Um, by the way, you know, walking through a rustling leaf forest, you know, with chestnuts and malt wine, perfect date. Works every single time, but I wouldn't know about that. Any case, so essentially very, very little of their production is grazed. Surprise, surprise. Well, not really, because the world is full of rotting plant material. So let's see what actually happens to the detritus. So about 7,900 kilocalories uh, go in. Bacteria colonize it, but bacteria live as well. And remember what I just told you, when plant material dies, it gets broken down, and then what? That breakdown causes CO2. So here we have half of that carbon is immediately respired by bacteria. We say, oh well, we give the microbes a little bit of lever here. Let's, have, let's see what happens to the rest of it up here. So, surprise, surprise. The detritus, which is not respired in a salt marsh by bacteria, is exported into other systems. And this is why you find lots of seagrass, lots of sticks, lots of mangrove leaves on, an, on, a, on a sandy beach next to an estuary after it rained. You might say, okay, what about at the top here? Is there actually much direct animal consumption? Not really. What we have is a mere 2% of the carbon gets directly captured, is directly captured, uh, eaten by animals, you know, insects, spiders, and so forth. So you might say, oh, this is all terribly depressing. Well, it's not. All you have to do is change your mind in terms of connectivity linkages between systems and uh, the fact that plant matter mostly dies but we actually eat it 
just like sauerkraut, and it's actually more nutritious because bacteria actually sit on it. But there's energy losses, uh, by the way. So I thought, well, let's go back and see whether all this thing is actually true. Is salt marsh carbon really important then when we talk as an exported material for fish, for prawns, for crabs, whatever it may be? And we just finished that one up in central Queensland, where there's mangroves and lots of uh, salt marshes behind the mangroves. And it's basically a very, very complicated way of expressing stable isotope tracing because we can express it then as how much of a prawn, banana prawn tissue comes ultimately from carbon produced by salt marsh. How much comes from C3 wetland plants, it's just like a, a complicated things for uh, uh, mangroves, really. And how much does come from the benthic microalgae? Remember that film sitting on the mud. And we did this for banana prawns, mud crabs, grunters, sweat fins, white things, and yellowfin frames. And really, really surprising, once you do proper chemical ecology, and not what you actually read on a book by people having opened up the stomachs is, like the yellowfin brain, most of those guys here, look at the white thing, obtain ultimately most of their energy uh, from carbon captured by salt marsh grass and then exported into the estuarine channel. Baba. So essentially, good old Teal here, he was right. But it's that export, that linkage, that coupling of systems which makes the carbon go from one system into the next, rot a little bit, James Cook, sauerkraut, and then ultimately make it into animal tissue. Quite cool, huh? And so it is a little bit of a change in thinking that we kind of as ecologists are accustomed, or maybe it's our human nature, that we kind of love that we love to have bloodthirsty carnivores romping around the water or the land and just eating stuff. But no, most food apps actually are a little bit more delicate and they work by the consumption of stuff which has died, not by predatory action, but by other causes. So here you go. Any questions on that before we move on? All right, so now for some, something completely different. Bear with me as well for a few seconds here. Now this is kind of a cool uh, image from an electron microscope. This thing is probably about, you know, I would say a thousandth of a millimeter big, but there is bigger ones of those. Now, who has a cat or a dog? And who had a rather unpleasant experience that sometimes your cat or your dog, particularly when they have been out uh, eating stuff which they shouldn't, they might go a little bit like and, and, and the neck becomes very long. And sometimes they then uh, void the gut, so to speak. And if you're very unlucky and you haven't left, and you have given your cat the proper bills, what you can actually land up with, and I didn't include that YouTube video, I think it was a little bit too much, you can actually land up with a whole handful of wormy things. So those are intestinal parasites. Now, those are called spool worms or nematodes or roundworms very common in most animals. As a matter of fact, as I sit here, I have worms. You have worms. Everybody has worms. They're all over. We can't escape them. However, most of them are actually very tiny and they don't actually do anything terrible to us. But understanding the energetics of estrogen systems, it's all about very small things. So when you talk about Estrine consumers, and here is a melange of them. Here we got a, a, a grab, a botanite grab. We got 
uh, venous muscle, we got one of the fiddler crabs, and we got a telenite uh, bivalve. Often, really, it is feeding either on phytoplankton or feeding on muddy things. And it's the organics within the mud, and often it is the detritus loaded. Seriously, guys? Sorry, guys, I, you know, we have, we have two magpies here. Can you see them? Maybe I'll, uh... Can you see them now? Uh... Yeah. You're going to go on YouTube if you carry on like this. All right, here we go. Um, I think this is actually the great thing about you know, doing lectures for home. You know? It's, it's such, so much more entertaining. Um, so often we actually then talk about you know, the bacteria and the detrital particles uh, which form a part of the animal nutrition. But ultimately, those bacteria get the carbon as well from rotting stuff. So you might recall you know, the term benthic, and this is basically the term when we talk about stuff associated or happening on the seafloor. Now, this is a royal banquet here. And when you actually go to banquets like this, uh, you know, if you ever get invited to Buckingham Palace, who knows, you know, I'm still waiting, you know, check the mail every day, it hasn't arrived, but one day it might, uh, is that there's a very, very strict order. So essentially you go, from the head of the table all the way down and here, well, they're not quite peasants, but essentially your position is very tightly controlled by uh, where you sit. We also, so we like that kind of order as human beings. And nothing more illustrates order and classification more than going to a museum. It's actually astonishing. There is, you know, basically, you know, racks and racks and shelves and shelves uh, of things in bottles, but they're all neatly classified, they're ordered. So somehow our brain feels, I think, more comfortable if we have a system uh, where we achieve order and we classify things. Now, nothing more, uh, nothing can better illustrate the idea of ordering and classifying things as this chap here is called Karl von Linné. He was a Swedish biologist, started off as a botanist, but basically sort of like and became a zoologist. And of course, he wrote the Systema Natura. So if you actually use a binomial name today, such as dog, Canis familiaris. He came up with that system of naming species and he also classified species into high categories. So for instance, you know, your Canis familiaris, your dog, belongs to the family of Canida and that itself belongs to the order of Carnivora. So, and it goes up and up, and that's of course the vertebrates and so forth, and mammalia, and then it goes into the vertebrates. So it's a system of classification. And ecologists use, unfortunately, not one system, but quite a variety of different uh, classification systems when it comes to dealing with estuarine animals or any other animals in the pentos. The first one is if you actually look at those, uh, those are organisms I, I used to work on a few years ago, you can actually classify animals simply by size. You can say, ooh, are they very small? Either smaller than 60 microns, which is 0 0.06 millimeters, uh, or uh, between you know, 60 microns and a millimeter or l larger than that. And you might say, this is an odd category. This is a really, really weird. And it actually has absolutely no meaning. It was just simply because those are some convenient sieve sizes, mesh sizes where you can actually wash animals out of the mud. So 
it stuck with us, but it actually doesn't really make terribly much sense. But you will actually encounter it quite frequently. This is actually much more sensible, but very, very difficult often in reality to determine because animals are flexible. They don't actually say, well, I'm a good Linnaean animal, so I will always be uh, basically a suspension feeder or a deposit feeder, or I go around and kill other things, or I just eat everything, or I am a vegan. Many animals cross those boundaries most of the time, but this is functionally very, very important. Or you say, Ooh, what do they do? Where do they actually occur? Do they stick out of the mud or are mobile and run around on top of it, or do they mostly live on the ground and bury in it? So we can actually classify animals based on life habit, or you basically say, are there accessory ones, i.e. are they attached, and it's like barnacles, can't go, ever go anywhere, or are they mobile and move freely. So in essence here, those are classifications which sit with us, or which basically we have been using for quite a while. Let's have a look at some of them. Uh, here is a group of very distinguished gentlemen, you know, somewhere in late uh, Edwardian times. But what is actually very, very interesting here is that many of them would have gathered here, and I specifically chose the picture, because they do the same thing. What do you mean by that? Well, this is a, a famous street in Austria, the Getreidegasse in Salzburg. The man, the great the great there, and you know, there's lots of, well, there used to be lots of Chinese uh, uh, tourists. And just up from here is basically where, you know, this funny fellow, I think they call him Mozart or something like this. I think he did music stuff, you know, uh, was born. So Mozart and people sort of kind of like him. And this is quite funny because in the old days, he had all those very specific signs. But look how they have adapted. Here is the McDonald's sign. And here is Jack Wolfskin and so forth. But originally... Those signs were specific symbols which denoted what type of shop was in it. And if you were a silversmith or a cobbler or a tailor, you could only use a specific symbol to denote, oh, here's a tailor. You didn't actually have to write it on, and people kind of knew that. Because people who are professions, uh, gathered to protect mostly their interests in what we called a guild. So the guilds, there was the guild of tailors, there was the guild of goldsmiths, the guild of cobblers, the guild of, you know, horsemen, whatever. And part of that was really that they could actually fix prices and protect their own commercial interests. And that's since the Middle Ages. And we still actually have it. We still have the Chamber of Commerce. Or we have the association of pharmacists. And largely they come from that old desire, let's just stick together and work out how we can benefit each other most. But basically the word guild means it's a bunch of folks who do the same thing. Now, ecologists have, and this was quite a clever move really, said, yeah, let's do away with this taxonomic classification of Carl von Linné and blah, blah. It's all a little bit artificial. So what about if we work out uh, what animals do and what animals belong to a class where all of them do roughly the same thing? So this is where the guilt concept was then adapted into ecology. And the most, I think, widely used one concerns, oh, you actually focus on the function feeding how you obtain your food, and what you eat. And the word uh, describing everything to do you know, with food is basically a nutrition, is trophic. This is actually a terrible word, I think, because uh, quite often people say to me, oh, shouldn't that be tropic? You know, because I don't actually know, know the tropics, but not trophic. But, so essentially, trophic guilds are a bunch of species 
who obtained the nutrition in a roughly similar way. So here we have some classic examples. This is a clam and a clam sits at the bottom and basically it has gills. It draws in water and it filters out fine particles. So we basically say, well, it's a suspension filler. But uh, this ugly beast here is a bloodworm and it's quite the opposite. It basically doesn't filter much, but it actually digs through the sediment and it uh, eats mud basically, digests whatever is nutritious in the mud and then tests it out the other side. So probably very few animals exist which, whoops, sorry, which have as many papers written about them as this one. It's a, a clam about this size occurs on the mudflats uh, of the North Sea called Macoma Baltica. And Macoma Baltica for decades was the arch typically the poster boy or girl of suspension feeders. And people said, right, here it is. And essentially it has this inhalant siphon and it throws the water in here. It might actually put it into current, filter stuff out and then it checks it. And then people just go, oh, not always good. I mean, there's a little bit of, you know, smartness to buy offs. So they can actually use this just like as a vacuum cleaner and become almost a deposit feeder. Amazing. I like, I like this video. Uh, uh, well, you know, you have to have strange taste to actually like something like this. And so, oops. Uh, here is, you know, a piece of mud and people put that in and you can actually see how it actually evolves over time. Of course, this is a time-lapse photography. But I actually kept once in a cuvette, which is actually a narrow piece of aquaria. I kept a few of those fellows. Yeah, you can see the Macomb Baltica and it's gone again. So it's actually much more mobile than we ever saw it. And I actually kept this in my office for a year. And every day it is slightly different uh, until one day, you know, the oxygen kind of ran out and it all turned black and uh, over. But it's actually quite a fascinating thing to do. And if you get a few yubbies from the nest tree, it's a free aquarium, you know, build one. I should actually do another one. Uh, and it's actually quite cool. And what it actually it teaches us is there's a lot of flexibility in it. Now here is a body kit that look quite nice, like a vermi thing. Uh, and this is what they look like as a blood worm when you take them out of the sediment. Not so cool. Uh, there's, a, there's a few basically uh, gills here and they're full of hemoglobin because the mud is often not very saturated with oxygen, and so they need lots of storage uh, capability. This thing actually shows what it actually does. If it starts off, uh, doesn't want to. I think after, oh, here we go. And it got this proboscis, which is basically the esophagus and the first few uh, percentages of his body, which actually it uses to grope through the sediment. There we go. So this is, of course, on a clean slate. But think about this thing going through it, you know, like a tunneling machine. Did you actually see that? It has all those spikes on the side, so it can actually anchor itself as it goes through the mud. Here is the gills. And does it come out again? No, no, no. There it goes. Here we go, whoa, off it goes again, and it tries to sort of find some mud. But what it actually does is you can actually know whether you have one of those deposit feeders by just looking at the little amount of uh, fecal coils, they, the selfish name they produce. And you, know, you go to Palmerston Passage or even the Mochi Estuary down from the Caravan Park, you actually see them. Uh, but here is a nice illustration, a very polite one. What they basically do is they eat themselves through the mud, a chest, whatever they don't uh, uh, assimilate out the other side, 
But what is really, really quite cool and a little bit unappetizing is there will actually be a point where they go back to the sediment they have defecated and eaten already. So they basically culture their own uh, ecosystem, which is full of bacteria, and eventually they eat their own uh, fetus at some point, but it's highly nutritious. But what they really do in terms of a wider ecosystem benefit, by constantly reworking the estuarine muds, they draw oxygen in it, they irrigate it, they create all those little uh, tubes and tunnels where water can flush through. And this is an important function. Otherwise, many of our estuarine muds would actually be black, stinky, very, very unpleasant uh, places if it wouldn't be for the role of those biodebaters. So biodebation is an enormously important function of those animals. Right. Uh, one of the great mysteries on Earth, and I have never quite figured that out, is you go to Holland or you go to Belgium, so you might have ordered eight pots of mussels, uh, bivalves. They, eat, uh, they drink tons of beer, and they eat chips with mayonnaise, with fat. And yet, you know, most people are not really quite overweight. I don't quite know how that actually works, but never mind. Look at those things. Um, and they come in the form of uh, mutilous black mussels here, or oysters. Now, what's so cool about them? So cool about is that they occur in very, very large congregations, congregations or reefs or accumulations, whatever you want to call them. So what you actually create is an army, a very large army of animals who do sus suspension feeding. Here we got some oysters in close on, and they're quite tightly packed together. But each one of them is drawing water in and then, you know, filtering the phytoplankton out and digesting it as feces. Now, and what they effectively do is, if they sit on the bottom of an estuary, they functionally link the water column with the bottom by drawing water in, filtering it out, it just feeds it, drawing more water in, and so forth, and so forth. So it can be very, very impressive figures, up to 300 cubic meters, right? That's 300,000 liters. That's a large volume of water. I would have actually used a more Australian term, but never mind. It's, it goes up on YouTube, so I have to be a little bit more careful. Uh, so essentially, they filter a shitload of water, which is, of course, a very scientific term, like a lot. So, and that basically means we are trying to bring oyster beds back because people say, ooh, they stabilize the shoreline, but through their pentopelagic coupling, they also clean up the water column. Look at this. They are supposed to be oysters in here and oysters in here. And no, it's just in here, and it's kind of murky water. It's really fascinating. Have you ever seen the cheese cam? There's actually a, a live webcam where uh, they installed it in a cheese maturation room, and absolutely nothing happens because essentially there's just a big loaves of cheeses sitting there. And as you can see, it's like, oh, look at this. Over time, the water becomes. Oh, look at this, now it's nice and clear. Ooh, and even clearer. And here's actually a little worm trying to get out. But essentially, we love oysters, not only because they taste good, but because they clean water up our estuaries. And it's that coupling between the water column and the dentus. There you go, that's the official uh, conceptual diagram. Now, is anybody going to have fish tonight? No. No? <laughs> uh, that was last night. <laughs> All right, okay. Probably a good thing. A typical reaction to seeing a warm and fish is. <laughs> so, okay. let's come down, take a deep breath, and talk about it like civilized people. 
just like local organic. So, you know, if you're a good zoologist and you have a, you know, uh, a forceps, there's hardly any piece of fish that you can't actually pull out a worm. And of course, there will never be a dog or a cat which doesn't actually have all sort of fascinating parasites in them. Now, of course, if you like to eat sushi and I eat it all the time, just go for it. Why do I say that? Uh, because ultimately, you can never ever escape uh, those small little critters. But it's always safe to actually cook stuff. Now, in a much less uh, confronting way, if you go, uh, now that we have social distancing, uh, 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 basically, you know, taking off our police uh, orders, I got actually chased off for sitting with a glass of wine on the seawall at Malulaba by myself uh, in the evening. And then the policeman said, oh, what are you doing here? You're light doing. I said, no, no, I'm exercising. I'm exercising my right arm. I mean, they had a good laugh, they let me finish it, but you know, any case, it's all over. So you might actually go to the beach and put out a beach towel and lie down. And you have sand. Let's say here's the sand. But be aware that you're probably lying on a few hundred thousand small little critters which live in between the sand. And what are they? Well, sand, you can actually filter water through it. And, you know, this is why we use uh, sand filters in swimming pools. This is why when a wave comes up a beach, it filters through the sand. And the next one comes up and it filters through the sand because it drains up. So there's actually space in between the sand grains. The sand grains here are very politely all colored. You know, so you can see the difference in the drawings of those vermin things. But the sand grains also grow bacteria. So there's space and there is food. And that space in between the sand grains or the mud grains is called the interstitial space. Interstitial meaning in between the uh, particles. Now, here is another picture which you know, comes from a textbook and you can see all these sort of things in here. And, and literally, they're everywhere. You can't actually escape them. Now, I found this website which is actually fascinating. I mean, the colors are not true, you just use some fancy computer program to color them in. But this is what you can find in between the sand grains. Here is a species of kynorinch, and it got this collar of spines. And so it pushes forward, spines out, put the body back, and so forth. Uh, here we have a tardigrade. That's a weirdly standard myself. Some people find them actually cute, but they got this big, big chores here, but they basically are like little teddy bears moving along in between the sand grains. Fascinating stuff. Then you got our nematode, our roundworms. Go in and watch the video here, you know, which actually explains it all, but it goes on and on and on and on. Or you can have a prior pulit. I've never seen one before, before I started. I did one paper on mayo fauna, and then I said, like, well, you know, as important as it is, you know, spending your time or your life behind uh, a microphone, uh, not a microphone, uh, <laughs> it's been a long day, be behind a microscope might not be the best option ever. Or, look at this thing, it's a gastrotrich. Now, gastrotrichs have all those hairs, and here, this one has decided, time to reproduce, and this is uh, a rather... Uh, unsavory affair because the uh, the body wall ruptures and out comes the big egg and then the female dies and here we got a copy boat remember we talked about copy boats as being the most abundant animal in the sea and essentially uh, uh, this is too bright it's a bit of a bummer uh, and essentially uh, working uh, to eat the phytoplankton and channel it down uh, to the bottom of the sea. But what we actually do have is elongated copra boats which live in between the sand grains. They never swim. Uh, so watch that video which actually explains it all. Uh, it's, it's all right, but it actually goes on and on and on. 
But what we actually have here, uh, come on, is a group of animals called the male fauna. And 20 animal phyla are represented in what we call the male panthers, which are those small animals in between the same grains. Most people don't know they exist, but they exist in every spoonful of mud you ever examine. Uh, nematodes, they round themselves often numerically dominant, but here is a list of really, really weird invertebrate phyla. Some of you, you might only encounter in between the same place. They don't occur anywhere else, but they're a separate phylum. So it's very, very species rich. They have to be kind of elongated because they have to move between the sand grains. And here is the most important thing. And this is how we wrap the lecture up in terms of energetics. They are small, they are very small. So each individual is light, it has a small biomass. But they don't live for very long, so they grow like crazy and the population turns over. That means they have to eat a lot. They need a lot of energy. So how we express this is they have a high production rate, productivity rate, in relation to their weight, to biomass. And it's called a production to biomass BB ratio. Think about it in the same terms as earning interest on uh, a, a stock of money, on a, uh, on a value of money. So essentially, productivity is the interest and PB is the, the amount of money invested. So my found they are really a good investment. And they really form what we call the small food web. It's not so much about the fish and the turtles and the dugons. Yes, this is all cool, but most of the energy actually goes to those guys. And here's the important thing. Yes, we care about we care about uh, prawns, we care about mullets, we care about stingrays. Why do we have so many stingray holes in the mud? I will show you now in front of my house, but it's all uh, tied us in. Because the stingrays come in and they hover and they eat all the animals out of the mud. But it's often the small guys which channel that energy from the microphytobenters and the bacteria up, just as copepods boats do in the open sea as plankton. Now, the best analogy I could actually uh, find, this was a book which greatly fascinated me when I was about six or seven, and I, and I always imagined it was real, Gulliver's Travel. And I saw all these small little guys here, you know, tying Gulliver around when he came to the land of Lilliput. However, the lesson is, they didn't manage to tie him down and he couldn't move anymore. Ta da! So, small can be very important. And here is a very famous example, and it was actually done. Uh, it's in every textbook on estuaries, and it just happens to be you know, uh, done by a very famous estuary ecologist, Donald McCluskey, who was actually an examiner on my PhD, which was quite funny. And, uh, it's a very, very a nice Scottish gentleman. I only had one problem. I had to have somebody, you know, translating the questions uh, for me because, you know, if you come from Glasgow, you know, it can be hard to understand to some people. But never mind. So he worked on estuary, which is the Eton estuary uh, on the east side of Scotland. Now, this is a very complicated looking table. But we are talking about real world data here. So... Here's the male fauna, here's the macrofauna. Uh, what you should actually look at, yes, the standing biomass. If you would actually extract all the male fauna from the mud and you extract all the macrofauna and you weigh it all up, there's about seven times as much. But they produce almost as much as the macrofauna. But when you work out, all right, the ratio of turnover to the standing stock, it is about five times as much. And this is even more bizarre in the linear ester, which is just down the road, but never mind. You know, yes, you have a big ratio, many more big animals, but actually work slower. The male fauna, small in size, but they produce more. You might say, hang on, uh, how can that be that there's such a large difference in productivity between small animals and large animals? 
Now, essentially, here is a nematode. Why can they be so important? Now, here is uh, a, a chart, uh, which actually I got out of uh, Tom McCluskey's book. I should actually you know, draw my own, but never mind. Essentially, if you want to create a kilogram of biomass of meiofana, because they're all so small and weigh so little, look at those, you know, you know, 0 0.001 gram, 0 0.00001, and it goes on. You have to chuck in a lot of nematodes for a kilogram of meiofana. In other words, if you know, you want to create a ton, let's say 10 tons of animal biomass, you might use this one here and this one and that one. Let's say three elephants. But you would actually need to have a quasillion of nematodes. Why is that important? Because there's a universal law in physiology, and that is as you go smaller and smaller in size, so you move from here to here, the metabolic rate per unit body mass just shoots up. Now, I could basically here uh, use a much fancier graph, but it's actually quite bizarre. Look at this thing. It actually looks like a nematode. And I just needed to do this quickly about four years ago, and I admit I, I put it on a photocopier and scanned it. And this is actually an eyebrow or an eyelash of me, and it looks exactly like an nematode. How weird is this? You know, late at night, I sort of... So essentially, what happens is the male fauna are so important because every individual, even though in total, there might not be as weighty, has an extraordinarily higher metabolic rate and hence processes energy much more faster than it actually happens for an elephant. The classic example, I think, is something like uh, a dog and a hummingbird. So the hummingbird is here and the dog is here, whatever. So basically, small, bop, you turn it over. So here is a food lab diagram you find in every standard textbook. I just translated it for you a little bit. So if you say, don't worry about the, the units. If, let's say, 350 units come in as total carbon supply, and again, look at the importance of the detritus, down to the pentos, about 75% of it basically gets processed to the male fauna compartment. And that actually explains and that carbon then goes on to large animals, but it is the processing of carbon by animals which live in between the particles of mud and sand, which more or less, you know, are the engine room of estuarine food webs. And let's uh, end today on something uh, some fun facts. And in 1915, there was a chap, I think he worked uh, yeah, for the Department of Agriculture in the United States, and he basically calculated, and it's probably quite true, that four out of every five animals, 80% of individuals on Earth are nematodes. Uh, you should actually have eaten, you know, something before that. So, if I... I should actually have more problems. Let's say here is that you know that potted plant. If uh, we take everything away from the potted plant, which is basically the plant, we would still be able to see exactly the outline of it, like a ghost image, because the nematodes would be everywhere and would still be in place. And it's like a a weird template. If, by some magic, I could remove all my flesh from my body, I would still be sitting here going, oh, you know, a nematode ghost. 
the reason for that is the nematodes would outline me. So what basically uh, Cobb came up with, and it's actually a very, very famous analogy, is he said, you know what? If we take life away as we know it, uh, we basically would create still a ghost image of the planet as we know it, entirely made by verbs. So if that is not a fun fact, I don't know what a fun fact is. And on that kind of wormy bombshell, you know, we uh, end today's wormy lecture. Right. Um, let's see if we have actually... Um,